This is going to be uh, short and sweet. I'm definitely not going to use a full hour here, so that's a good thing for everybody. Uh, at the end of a, a long day, heading into a long weekend. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the pollinator work we've been doing with the, with the neonicotinoid insecticide, the poncho and the cruiser. Although some of these cover crop issues do touch on that, and I will will make those uh, connections when we get to that section of the presentation. So the first thing I always point out uh, when I when I give these types of talks, cover crop groups, is that. This commitment to cover crops has to include a commitment to scouting uh, for insect pests because there are some pests, and, and you know what they are. There's one one real headliner that comes to mind that um, you're at significantly more risk of, of dealing with these pests when you do cover cropping. And so there are a lot of benefits to cover cropping, but it's not all um, the same as as going with uh, with cover crop fields as far as the pest management. So, the, the picture that we're talking about is, in the springtime, we have uh, cool uh, conditions, we have soils that are uh, not yet uh, been worked at all, often you don't have even herbicide uh, beginning to be applied. These are the types of things that attract migrating insects into the field. A lot of our insect pests, our key spring insect pests, don't overwinter here in Indiana. Although, interestingly, they're, they're overwintering in Indiana more and more as we're having a trend of milder winters. Um, corn earworm, for example, uh, just in the last 10 or 15 years has moved its overwintering line up um, by about uh, what, 100 and 125, 150 miles, something like that in Indiana. But uh, many of these pests come in from outside. That's the point here. Uh, they reside full time in the states to the south, the Gulf states in particular, uh, and then move are moved north on weather fronts. So uh, you get storm fronts that are uh, moving through the United States. They're moving, you know, west to east often, sometimes south to north in the springtime, and they're picking up these insects that are that are way up, in, you know, in the jet stream actually. And these insects aren't flying really in a direct way. They're sort of tumbling along on the jet stream and waiting for the barometric pressure to change, and then they, they literally almost rain down uh, with, with storm fronts that are bringing precipitation. So where the insects wind up is difficult for even the insect to predict. They don't know where they're going to be in terms of which state or which part of which state. But when they get close to the ground, that's when their orientation comes into play. So they don't just land you know, willy-nilly in any old field and start dumping off eggs. These are uh, these insects that are they're often already loaded with eggs, they've been mated. Many of them are moths. And even though they don't take care of the eggs or, or sit on them or anything like that or take care of the babies, they are good moms because they look for a good place to lay the eggs. And these are some of the things here that attract this, this laser pointer is toast. But you can see them up there. Those are some of the things that attract the insects into the field, the weeds, cover crops, crop residues, green manure, all these things have in common organic material, right? The source of nutrients. Depending on what the insect is, they may be attracted to uh, different um, uh, ingredients on that list. So that's just to reflect the fact that even if you don't do cover crop activities, you've still got risk factors that make one field more likely than another to have insect uh, problems in the spring. So you also get uh, positive results of this, of course. Uh, many of you have been doing the cover crop thing for a number of years, know that you attract beneficial insects in there. And especially after it's been going for a few years, you ideally will build up a reservoir of these insects. Uh, things like brown beetles that are predators of rootworms and black cupworms and army worms and other things uh, will eventually come to reside in that field. Uh, a lot of seed predators, so weed, uh, or rather ground beetles that eat weed seeds, will start residing in the field. Uh, predators of insects um, like aphids will begin to become resident in the field if you have a cover crop. All of these things are more likely if you have a non-corn uh, uh, or soybean crop in the field in between the cropping sessions. And I'll come back to that later. <clears throat> so winter annual weeds, we all have dealt with them. There are many types. Um, 
black cutworm is attracted to virtually all of them. So one of the things about black cutworm that makes it so troublesome and so familiar to everybody is that it has an incredibly broad host range. Anybody from a home gardener uh, to somebody that's growing um, uh, corn or tomatoes in the uh, in Florida uh, and in, in other parts of the uh, southeastern U.S. has dealt with black cover. It's a huge pest of many, many crops. We've all seen them and we all uh, have had to deal with them. Uh, they have the name black cutworm, uh, and the emphasis is on the cut portion of the name. But once you see this, and it's like this corn plant here, it's usually too late to do anything economically. Uh, so the key is to catch the damage early when you just see notching on the edges of leaves. Those two cutworms there that I've uh, put the arrow pointing at, that's the size when they start cutting. So you can see they're just, th that larger one at the top, uh, the next stage after that is pupation and then a moth. So that large one at the top is, has been out there for a long time, feeding on the crop. Um, you want to get them smaller. The one that's directly on the penny is the second instar of six. So they have six stages that they go through. And the earlier it is, the less they eat, the less damage they cause, and of course the easier it is to kill. All insects, just like weeds, are easier to kill when they're small. And that's why we always say, you know, uh, to, to scout early and to get those insect pests early. <clears throat> there are other risk factors that we worry about. Uh, some of those are listed here. I want to focus in on the second one down, which is spring moth arrival. Uh, every year we monitor for moths of various species in the spring. We use pheromone traps. I know some of you in this room I recognize they've worked with us on that. John Obermeyer coordinates this trapping network uh, of pheromone trap cooperators. We also have blacklight traps that run all through the season and capture all sorts of moths primarily at night. So we have some early warning system. And when we have that peak of spring moth arrival, there will always be a, an alert or a note that goes out in our pest and crop newsletter that uh, most of you will be familiar with that basically says, okay, Lots of cutworms came in, and very often it will follow closely on the heels of a major uh, weather event. It's a series of storms, uh, a low pressure system has come through. So that's one where we have some degree of predictability. I mean, it does depend on the weather, but just because the moths are here doesn't mean uh, that it's too late to begin treating. So usually the way we frame the, the article is that we say, okay, the moths are here, Now's the time to begin looking for that early damage. Um, herbicide and tillage timing. Of course, I think, I think this has been well covered in the past. You all know that uh, once the weeds get large, um, you've been feeding, uh, well, they're harder to kill, but also you've been feeding black cutworm and other insects for a while, right? So that's another benefit to treating weeds as early as possible. Um, again, the range of weeds that black cutworm feeds on is much longer than you have space for on this slide. There, the list of plants that they can't eat is a lot shorter than the list of plants that they do well on. So which ones in terms of cover crops? Uh, there's not a lot of information out there in terms of uh, the relative um, uh, preference for cover crops. Uh, I think that, uh, and that reflects that the black cutworm is so totally, uh, uh, what's the word, it's not at all picky in its food sources. So I think as we plant more and more cover crops, we'll get a few more clues as far as, you know, if some are very strongly preferred versus others, um, our mix is beneficial in terms of uh, perhaps uh, uh, sort of uh, spreading out the risk in terms of uh, whether cutworms are attracted to one or the other. So a lot of these things we don't know. We don't have good Indiana data or even Midwestern data for uh, this particular species. There are other cutworms as well. Variegated cutworm is one of them. Um, we treat, for management's sake, we treat all the cutworms the same in general. So there are lots of tools that we have, insecticide tools, many of them are pyrethroids, um, that we use for the cutworms. And the keys are, number one, uh, early application, and number two, use lots of water. Uh, the variegated cutworm is similar to the black cutworm in the host range and the preferences where they lay eggs. Uh, they look a little bit different and their feeding is different as well. You see this picture on uh, your right here is a plant that you can see has been completely defoliated by the variegated cutworm. So these are our climbing cutworms. 
Um, and not all of the cut worms do cut it. These ones never cut, even when they get to their largest size. Um, with any cut worm, you can find them very easily. Um, just by looking if you, where you see the damage and look along, you'll see, perhaps you'll see two or three plants damaged in a row. And look at both ends of that damaged area, and you will find, more often than not, you will find the cut worm under a soil uh, clod or under a little bit of residue. They don't go far from that last plant they damaged. Of course, you don't know if they're going east-west or west-east, so you might have to dig two, a couple of places before you find them, but you'll usually find them out there. Uh, they don't go very far. And if, you want, if you're really ambitious, you can go out there at night with a flashlight and catch, catch them in the act. Uh, that's what my mom did not too long ago. She had the meeting of parsley. And I told her I thought it was these, and sure enough, she went out there one night, and there they were, and she controlled them all manually. She did not use insects. <laughs> she just crushed them all in a blind rage. <laughs> um, but cutworms, are, you know, are, are familiar to everybody. Uh, we have tools to control them. Um, a lot of times when we talk about cover crops, we act like they're a separate universe from other systems or other ways of are conventionally cropping systems. Uh, but they're really not because a lot of these uh, practices are very similar to cover crops. Basically, what you have when you have cover crops is you have green growing material that is relatively scarce at a time when it's relatively scarce, right? You have food out there. Uh, sometimes it's not green and growing. Sometimes it's dead and dying and, and stinky, um, and especially those radishes that smell really, really bad. Um, so, but, it, but you have a, a resource out there that will not go ignored by uh, insects. Uh, they will find it, uh, they will use it, they'll lay eggs in it. Many of those insects are completely uh, irrelevant for agriculture in terms of causing damage. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. But there are lots there that are fall into that neither category. It just creates diversity. Many of them are probably doing positive things in the long run, but they're just not well studied. But the reason I put this slide up is I want people to get, get a feel for the fact that um, insects are never doing these things randomly, and this, some of this is very predictable, uh, because you have this resource out there that's going to be very appealing. So which insects come in, and when do they come in? That's what we're trying to uh, get a handle on. Early planting, some farmers that are very ambitious and plant extremely early will often have some of the same problems that uh, cover crop uh, the cover crops are afflicted with. <clears throat> so if you have a dying weed or a dying cover crop, and especially if it's, if it's decomposing in a, on some of those warm spring days, you will almost always get seed corn maggots. Seed corn maggots look like small house flies. Uh, they're in every field, every year, um, and usually are not pests. Uh, as the name suggests, they can feed on uh, uh, the seeds of corn, they can feed on the seeds of virtually anything. They like dead, dying, decaying material. In most cases, the seed corn maggot is a secondary invader. So if you have a healthy stand of corn that was planted into good conditions, seed corn maggot is not something you generally worry about. The corn plant will power right through it. If you get corn that's planted into cool, wet soils, or the soils get wet and cool after planting, and the corn seed kind of sits there, uh, that's when the seed corn maggot can start to become a problem. And of course, if you have green manure, if you have dying weeds, they're feeding on that, come in and plant, especially corn, usually corn, uh, and the maggots will move over to that. But this, I would put definitely as a lower tier of pests, uh, a less uh, troublesome pest, certainly, than black cutworm and, uh, and a couple of the other things we'll talk about today. One thing we found with seed corn maggot, though, is that when you have a large infestation, you have high pressure, uh, the seed treatments, the poncho and the cruiser, that were thought to be really good on seed corn maggot aren't actually as good as we thought because it was, I believe, two years ago we had some really good seed corn maggot conditions, good pressure. Um, maybe it was three years ago. Um, and we had stand loss, we had lots of maggot feeding and going through uh, the poncho 500 and the cruiser 600. It was pretty surprising. We don't plant trials for seed corn maggot because it's so infrequent. It's hard to duplicate. It's hard to get good seed corn maggot pressure. And frankly, it's just not a big, not a big pest. But it, it can go through some of these seed treatments. That's the, the main message that we found recently that we didn't know about a few years ago. 
So the solution here with C-Core Magnet and a lot of these tests is this host-free period. And this is kind of alluded to in some of the management uh, guides that you see put out by uh, cover crop seed companies and, and other universities. But it, it usually, I haven't seen it put uh, really uh, explicitly or bluntly that a lot of these insects, insect larvae like maggots and caterpillars, grubs, they will starve really quickly. They need to eat all the time. Their, their purpose as larvae is to eat and gain weight and get big. Um, they can't fly. They can't usually even walk all that far. So <clears throat> if they have a period with no food, uh, let's say they're, they're, they're feeding on um, uh, the rye cover crop, and the rye cover crop is dead and dying, and there's a period with nothing there that's alive and growing, uh, for 10 days, you will kill virtually every uh, army worm. I'll talk about them in a minute in that field because they need to eat constantly. They're, they're so uh, voracious and they're growing so quickly that there's not a period where they can just sit and not feed. Okay? That's what distinguishes larval insects from adults in many cases. A lot of adult insects don't feed at all and certainly can go without for a week, a month, sometimes even longer. It's not the case with maggots and caterpillars and things like that. They need to eat. Okay, armyworm is, is the big one, I think, that most people worry about when they get into this, uh, into this world. Um, annual grasses are the armyworm host, so if you're rearing armyworms, that's what they like the best. Uh, that's kind of what their uh, sort of ancestral host is. Before we had commercial agriculture, they fed on these types of grasses. They like corn, too. It doesn't, they don't do as well on corn, but they do just fine. Um, we have, luckily, no overwintering up here. So everything that comes, comes from the south. And some years we have nothing. Uh, Kentucky always has some to deal with. Um, and the, the Kentucky, uh, my equivalent in Kentucky, Doug Johnson, usually warns us on years when things are look a little bit more um, foreboding than, than others. But we haven't had a real infestation in a long time. Um, BT corn and seed treatments won't control infestations. Uh, so you don't, I don't want to give anybody a false sense of security about this particular pest. Um, the BT hybrids aren't strong on armyworm, and seed treatments uh, generally are too uh, low in concentration in the tissues by the time the armyworms come through. Usually when the armyworm moves into corn, uh, they're larger. They're not, they're, they don't uh, begin their lives on corn, they usually begin on something else. And any of you that have seen little, these little spotty infestations beside uh, wheat or, or even in association with cover crops know what I mean. That they usually start out on something earlier in the year and move to corn later. Uh, anybody know why they're called armyworms? Any idea? Mm -hmm. uh, generally, the, the, it's one of these things that uh, I never thought about until recently and I had to kind of look it up. But um, when they move, they move in a large group. They, so they cue into the fact that, okay, this resource is depleted, let's go, and they all are on the same queue. So they're almost moving like an army together. They're crossing roads, crossing ditches, and if you've ever seen them, I mean, you could get literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them crossing a road. And John Overmeyer has been doing this for years and years, talks about going over roads and having slippery tires because there's so many uh, army worm guts all over the road. So I've never seen that many, but I've, I've seen plenty of them, and I can imagine that it's, it's probably true. Um, here are some little facts about large army worms. Uh, like other caterpillars, there are six larval instars. Uh, but look at that second sentence there in that first point. The amount of foliage eaten in the sixth instar is seven times as much as the fifth. And more than 80% of everything they eat is in that sixth instar. Unfortunately, that's when people start noticing them and say, oh, geez, something's eating the corn. Um, that's when they're, they're maximum size and they're the hardest to kill, and you've already lost something in many cases. So this is one of those ones where there is no substitute for scouting through, uh, getting out, walking through, and you'll see that little bit of notching, and you'll see the army worms. That's, this is one uh, insect that you can often see during the daytime. Uh, they're not necessarily feeding, but they're hanging out usually uh, down in the axle or near, down near the base of the plant. They do most of their feeding at night, but they're not like black cover worm where you have to dig them up. Um, there's loads and loads of parasitism on army worms. So by the end of an infestation, um, most of those larvae, those big six instar larvae, are just loaded with parasites inside them. 
uh, and the vast majority don't make it to adulthood, uh, which is good for the next generation. Um, and they actually pop out of the army worm while it's still alive. They chew their way out and they make a little cocoon and then a little black wasp pops out. Um, but this usually is not in time for management. In fact, it's almost never in time for, for what the farmer needs in terms of getting these things killed. Uh, and in fact, what happens is that this sixth instar that is parasitized is eating more than one that isn't, which you can imagine, it's eating for whatever, uh, 58 instead of just one. Uh, so they're eating, 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 eating more than they would if they were not parasitized. So probably the, the net is, is a, they're consuming more. Uh, again, this, it's not going to survive to be a moth and mate and lay eggs, but um, that's not that much comfort in the springtime when, when the crop is affected. So uh, there's lots of good biocontrol that happens, not enough for management. So there, you have to take uh, steps to intervene. They're easy to kill with insecticides. There's not resistance or anything like that. So when you look at the, uh, the uh, recommendations that feature uh, a lot of pyrethroids, again, uh, all of those are effective. Um, and again, lots of water and, and so forth. Get them early. Same, same rules as for black cover. So this is another one that we monitor for. Uh, this is black light trapping data. And you can see it's 97 up to 2001. 2001 was the last year that there was a big uh, consistent outbreak. And you can see the numbers of moths is almost uh, an order of magnitude, almost 10 times what it is in the non-outbreak years. So it is really a boom or bust type of insect. And as I said, in Kentucky, they usually get these trends before we do, and we have an early warning system down there. <clears throat> the Pest and Crop Newsletter, I'll put another plug for that. Uh, we always track army worm and cut worm in the spring. Every year we'll have updates on those two, as well as other pests, but those are the big two. We never miss those because um, they can cause a lot of, uh, a lot of economic damage. Um, Again, applying bird down herbicides two to three weeks before planting. I know that's easier said than done. Uh, weather conditions have a lot large part to play in it, but it's, it's a goal that's worth keeping in mind. Uh, starvation is the absolute easiest and best way to get management of a lot of these pests. Uh, you won't even have known they were there in many cases if the uh, herbicides applied at the right time. Uh, they'll, they'll just starve and you won't see them. Uh, most seed of most field crops is treated, as we know. You can see that slide on the right, it's all familiar to you. Um, so soybeans, corn, uh, many crops we don't grow here, cotton, sorghum, et cetera, et cetera, canola, wheat. Uh, pretty much you name it, it's treated with insecticide. But what do those insecticides do? What kind of security can they give you? Especially when you're in a cover crop situation and your risk for spring pests is certainly higher. Uh, this is a summary table uh, of some of the common pests going across the top. I have a legend at the bottom, but I'll read it to you anyway. Corn rootworm, white grub, wireworm, seed corn maggot, and black cup. And what you see there is we don't have any uh, excellence for e, e for excellent control. We have some fares, uh, not applicable means it doesn't do anything, and we have some goods. But overall, I mean, the picture is I think that. They're not really a strong uh, performer for a lot of these pests. And the reason is not that they aren't uh, you know, good insecticides. It's just that when you put these on a seed, you're only getting a maximum of 20% of it into the plant. So they've done, and we're doing some of this too, where you look at, let's say you have cruiser at the 1.25 milligram rate. That's Poncho 1250. Uh, of those 1.25 milligrams, a maximum of 20% goes into the plant. More often it's closer to the minimum, which is 2%. Where does the rest of it go? It goes in the water, in the soil, it disperses elsewhere. Uh, so what that means is you just cannot get enough insecticide into the plant to protect the plant from these larvae, some of which are pretty big. Um, you know, these, these pesticides are... Uh, it's not for lack of trying getting it into the seed or getting more on the seed, but I mean, eventually you have to give up and say, okay, this is the biggest we can go, otherwise you're planting marbles out there because you've got so much insecticide on the things. Um, so, bottom line here is that you don't get any kind of, um, you know, predictable, strong control of most of these pests. Uh, we haven't seen it 
uh, and my colleagues throughout the Midwest have, have experienced some similar things. Um, we've done some work that I thought I would highlight here to follow up on a little bit more on what the efficacy is. So how, how do they work in regular cropping systems? So this isn't cover crop specific, um, but what we wanted to do was get a better picture of how well seed treatments work across the state of Indiana. And these are the sites we use, uh, one of them close to here, TPAC. Uh, many of you know these, know these locations throughout the state. We picked our three sites where we had the highest traditional uh, insect pressure. And you can see our treatments there, our naked seed uh, treated with Poncho 250 and fungicide and Poncho 1250 and fungicide. And through the season we followed these corn plants and collected stand counts, plant heights, root injury, and yields. So this is pretty standard uh, efficacy work uh, that we've done in other systems before. We just Sorry about that. We just never really focused in on the seed treatments. And one of the reasons is a lot of us in field crop entomology, we're looking really closely at Bt. And what does it do to monarchs, to butterflies, to this, to that, and the other thing. And the Bt was getting so much research attention. And what refuge is the best? And on and on and on that I think these, these insecticides were really neglected. Uh, that's my, my personal theory why we don't have the data. But anyway, we're generating some now. And I'm going to show you a little bit of it. So we've done it for three years. I'm going to show you the 2012 data and the 2013 yield data, of course, we don't have yet. Um, these are our stand height counts. In, in each graph, I'll use the same color legend. Naked seed is yellow, Poncho 250 is pink, and 1250 is more of a purple. Uh, you can see no statistical difference. There are, there are not really any trends happening um, that are significant. The root ratings, so this is where we look for some evidence of rootworm feeding. We didn't have a lot of rootworm pressure and we didn't have anything else down there feeding either. So again, we don't have any statistical differences in terms of how much damage there is to the roots in July. And then the all-important yield, we also don't have differences. Remember this last year was the drought year, especially for those first two sites. And you can see Penny up in Laporte, Porter County got, got a bit more timely rain. Uh, so this is not to say that these seed treatments don't work, that they're a waste of money, but it is to say that um, every seed doesn't have to be treated, although that's what we're currently doing. Uh, that's not based on pest pressures out there. We've dug a lot of seeds up, I have, and looked for bugs down there, looked for something feeding. It's really hard to find insects feeding on these seeds, uh, and it's hard to find damage. I don't think that's so much because they're not there, I think it's because our modern hybrids are so uh, competitive and efficient and grow so quickly that they power right through this, most of the damage that would have really caused them problems 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, all of you have been farming longer than I've been uh, working in this area, so you know that the hybrids of the 80s and 90s, when most of our insect pest thresholds were developed, and they haven't been updated, um, those hybrids from the 80s and 90s are very different than the ones today. The knee high by 4th of July thing is, is no longer, I don't think, uh, something that is a yardstick for, for a good crop. So one of the things we want to do next year is plant some old seeds, some, uh, some hybrids from back then, and plant some newer hybrids and see how they do in resisting some of these challenges. See, uh, if, we, if we use the old thresholds versus on new plants, are we wasting our time? Are we being overly conservative because these plants are ultra, super competitive? I think we are. I think these, these plants grow through a lot of stuff that the old plants wouldn't have. And uh, this, this, these kind of data, the fact that I keep getting these results over and over again, and I had them in 2011 and so far in 2013, made me think that I want to revisit some of these, some of these numbers. So that doesn't directly relate to cover crops, but since seed treatments are one of the tools that, are, that is, is sort of uh, important for cover crop, uh, fallen cover crops, I thought I'd mention it. Okay, uh, this is again, I thought I'd mention three times to leave that host free period. Uh, so, so there's your third one. Plant when soils are ready so you don't end up like this uh, poor uh, producer who is in deep trouble. On the BT hybrids, uh, they're not all the same. There are many out there. Uh, there are stack traits. Uh, there's, I think, some confusion on what controls what. Um, so. Read the label and know what you have control over, what, you, what you're uh, getting control over. A lot of times the 
label might say uh, the word suppression. And suppression is one of these sort of, you know, weasel words that is almost, I interpret it as better than nothing. Um, so it'll suppress pest population. Well, will it suppress it from 100 to 98? Because that doesn't do me a lot of good. Um, I want control on the label to know that, you know, this particular BT hybrid is controlling pest X. And, and most of the BT hybrids where control is concerned are excellent. And they provide very, very strong control. But on the other hand, for uh, some of these other pests, you don't get it. Viptera for cutworms uh, is, is the strongest of the BTs that we've tested. <coughs> um, scouted fields, again, especially as the main crop planting draws near. If you've had that nice host-free period, of course, there, there isn't any utility in scouting fields because you are zeroing everything out. Uh, you're presumably getting the benefits of the cover crop without, uh, without having some of the, the bad points in terms of insects being left over. Um, I always strongly advocate for not putting insecticides in just in case for, for all the obvious reasons of, you know, there's some insects there that you want to keep around. It's an extra cost. Um, insecticides are, are, you know, we always preach to use them when you need them, like, like any other tool, instead of just in case. I know that the, the temptation is strong with commodity prices being incredibly high. Um, we've done work in cover crops this year to look at Continuing the pollinator work that we started a couple of years ago with honeybees, we wanted to look at what other pollinators are out there in cover crops. And one of the ones we locked in on is crimson clover, uh, because it's a, a legume that's very attractive to a lot of pollinators. Not just honeybees, but little leafcutter bees and, and so on. And so next year I'll show you some of those results, or later this year, uh, and some photos of them. But one of the things I want to share with you is that those cover crops, especially the legumes, are very good at scavenging and pulling up uh, neonicotinoids out of the soil and expressing those in the pollen and the flowers. Uh, and of course, the pollen and the nectar of the flowers is what the honeybees and other bees are after. Uh, so we consistently will find, we've not, uh, we, we found it every single time that when a field has, has been planted with treated crops in previous years, which is every cornfield and most soybean fields, um, that the following cover crop, the, uh, in the case of crimson clover especially, will pull up the neonicotinoids. So what, the rates are generally low, uh, so they're down between 3 and 12 or 13 parts per billion. So you're not going to see an insect just keel over on the spot, but they're not so low that they're completely out of the realm of, of where you would see mortality. So uh, to put that in perspective, that's about one quarter or one fifth of the LD50, the lethal dose to kill half the organism, the insects to feed on, the honeybees to feed on. And of course, we don't have LD50s for little leaf cutter bees and mason bees and all these things because nobody has developed them yet. Um, but one fifth of the LD50, I think, is it's important because if you imagine they're, they re enter that field five times to get five meals, well, they've, they've gotten enough to, to cause some problems. So, anyway, we're still working on that, but I wanted to mention that, that those cover crops actually are, do have seed treatment pesticides in them. And it's, it's clothiamid and a bunch that usually shows up. Thiamethoxum, which is cruiser, as soon as it gets into a living system, is metabolized to clothiamid. So when you see me or other people talk about these seed treatments and they keep showing clothiamid, which is poncho, that could have easily started out as cruiser. Uh, so it's not that we're just picking on one compound or one company. They wind up being the same in the environment. It's just been a reverse engineering to get around the patent. Um, Henbit dead nettle is the other one we've looked at, and we've seen it in there too. Uh, we've seen the neonicotinoids in those also. That's a super uh, common plant and a very, it's not cover crop, but it's a very uh, common annual weed, and pollinators love it. So this is, this is where cover cropping meets sort of, you know, some of our interests right now, which is looking at things like pollinators. And, you know, last talk talked about unintended consequences. Uh, we're looking at the unintended consequences of things like seed treatments over the landscape and uh, the fact that they're so persistent, they last for years in the soil, and these plants are really good at picking them up. Okay, so to finish off, uh, cover crop insect problems aren't worse, but they definitely are different. Uh, that commitment to scouting is something that has to be in your mind some years more than others. All right, with that, I will stop. Thank you.